This episode is sponsored by Kindred Bravely. Kindred Bravely came to life in 2015 by Deanne Akerson, a mom of two, when she couldn't find any comfortable and functional pajamas while nursing her second son. So she decided to design her own line. As moms, we have to stick together, which is where Kindred comes from. And Bravely, well, we all know being a mom can be tough. It is not for the faint of heart. It takes courage and bravery to be a mom. And at Kindred Bravely, they are devoted to making life easier for pregnant and nursing moms, from breast pads and non-skid socks to nursing bras and pajamas. And I might not be pregnant or nursing, but I can advocate completely for how comfortable their clothing is. I wear the uh, cardigan almost every single day, certainly around the house. And I gifted my sister some leggings. Um, She is pregnant with her third child, and she is absolutely over the moon for them. She wants me to get her some more. So you can get your own and save while you do by using my code UNSTRESS20 to save 20% off your purchase at kindredbravely.com. You're listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Welcome back. It has been a while since I've released an episode. Thank you so much for being patient and uh, continuing to come back to the show, even though we were on a little bit of a hiatus. And I'll tell you why, if you don't already know, I have been actually dipping my toe into acting and modeling here in Atlanta. Um, the, The acting scene is really blowing up here. There's a lot more productions moving down south, buying up land, creating new stages. And so I saw a lot of opportunity um, to expand my creativity and just do something drastically different. Um, But I'd actually done theater in high school and college. Um, Even when I studied abroad in France, I took a theater class uh, at my French university. And so yeah, it's always been a part of my life, something that I, I really love to do. And I think honestly gave me, um, gave me a foundation to do, to do the podcast because I had been used to performing, but I had, um, a role in the movie Harold and the Purple Crayon. But prior to that, I was just there as Zoe Deschanel stand in. So meeting her and Zachary Levi and Ralph Howery was just amazing. And all of them are just wonderful, beautiful people. And, you know, the crew was amazing. The director, Carlos Saldana was awesome. I mean, it was really astonishing. I knew from the first day that it was going to be a really, um, fantastic experience, uh, life-changing and I was right. And I think, um, all of my other stand-ins were amazing and, and helped me be better and do better because we would actually run the scenes, um, before the main actors came in. And so it was just, It was really hard, um, 12 to 14 hour days every single day, but at the same time, it was life-giving and truly expanding. And I'm just so grateful that I had that experience. So that is a long way of saying um, or explaining why I was away from the microphone, but I think honestly, it's made me better and it's given me a chance to come back to the microphone with a fresh perspective and just um, to be reinvigorated to do this work and to send out content that that is valuable to you and not just the same old thing. And so I'm so excited to be back and to bring you an amazing guest this Mother's Day week. I am speaking with Lunia CEO and founder Ashley Merrill, and we're diving into why intentional rest and downtime is way more than just self-care for busy moms. Um, we talk about why sleep in particular, good sleep, changes the game when it comes to your personal health, your your resiliency, your ability to be present in your work and with your family, and even why creating intentional time to rest, truly rest, not do work, not to answer emails while you're in bed or on the couch, but really say, okay, this is my time to rest, how that actually has a surprising effect on your kids. And so we get into that. And I think you're really going to love that. So if you do enjoy this episode, this episode, that's been a long time coming, please uh, do me a favor and leave a review for the show that does so much in getting the word out to more and more listeners who need to hear this kind of content, who, who would benefit from it. So thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Ashley Merrill. 
Well, hello, Ashley. Welcome back to the show. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been a minute since we chatted last. It was 2019 when I last had you on the show. How has your life changed, your purpose changed uh, since we spoke last? Well, I'm, I work from home, at least the vast majority of my day, which is a pretty significant shift. Um, and I would say, um, you know, involved with more companies if we're talking professionally and then privately or my, in our private life, um, you know, we don't have a nanny anymore. So we're kind of like getting a bit more, you know, hands on and our kids are getting more independent. And so, you know, definitely at sort of a different stage. Yeah. I feel like that happened for so many people, you know, the COVID era, um, it really, it, it brought in a shift of priorities and, and what, you know, we thought was okay with like pushing forward and grinding and that was the norm. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, wait a second, maybe this isn't, you know, it isn't working for us anymore. And I love that you just, you just hit that right on the head. Why do you think so many people are waking up to a different way of living now than we've never really experienced before, at least in this country? You know, I think change happens little by little. Um, and I think that almost we don't know it sneaking up to us. And, and I'm saying apart from COVID for a second here, but I think that the lifestyle we were living crept up on us. You know, if you think about it, and I, I sometimes remind myself, you know, the advent of the cell phone and then really a cell phone that has email on it and, and thousand other apps and ways to connect. This is new. Um, and so having a work life that never turned off and this like always on availability, um, I think this is, this is kind of, we're, as a society, we're still kind of absorbing what this means and having this sort of no downtime, no shut off. And so I think that in some ways it was, um, an inflection point for us to finally look at ourselves and be like, is this, is this it? Is this what this looks like? You know, and, and really, um, and be introspective and take pause. And so, yeah, I definitely felt, um, for me, I will say I had been very anti-work from home. So I, I will be the first person to say, I didn't think that was going to work and I'm loving it, embracing it. I picked my kids up from school. You know, it doesn't mean that I, I actually probably in some ways I work more, but I love that it's, it's efficient and flexible and, you know, I, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, it's definitely more intuitive, I feel like, because I'm the same way. It's like you you are working probably more hours and, and, and more in, intensely, but at the same time, you are able to go get the kids. You are able to make muffins like I did yesterday, and it's just it's such a different way t to flow, really, with life rather than fight and, and be in these little constructs. Um, have you picked up any new like hobbies or interests? You know, I know a lot of people did over the pandemic that actually stuck with you? Well, I would say um, certainly some during the pandemic, but really lately I have just in general, I've started woodworking. Um, my dad is a woodworker, so he's been teaching me how to do it, which is really fun. Um, there's something really cool about going from being a digital person who's on their keyboard all day to being a person that gets to like build something with their hands. So I'm, I'm really enjoying that. And that, I would say that's more recent. That wasn't so much of like a COVID advent, but, uh, definitely something I'm loving. Oh, and then I would say my workouts moved to YouTube and I definitely haven't gone back. I used to be like a full class pass, like go to a studio, kind of a workout person. And I love YouTube workouts. It's free. It can be like any time of day that I'm available, any duration I want. I can work around injuries or, you know, I'm just like such a fan of the YouTube workout. I love that. I'm right there with you. I'm a big fan of like Sarah Beth Yoga. I can do her like first thing in the morning. It's like 10 minutes, super easy. And, and yeah, I'm addicted to that too. So how do you define, I know this is such like a strange thing to ask, but how do you define balanced motherhood? Is there such a thing? Um, is it possible? I always like asking like super successful women who seem to have it all figured out. Like, how do you how do you put that into different compartments and and make it work so that when you go to bed at night you feel like okay, you know, I was I was there for my kids and I was also you know rocking it you know for work or at least you know some semblance of that. Well. My mom used to say, or does say, that there's no balance, there's only rebalance. Um, 
I think that idea of, you know, and, and cause even with our kids, if we use them as an example for a minute, but you know, my kids, what they needed at two is different when they needed at four and, and quite different than what they need now is almost a nine and seven year old. Um, and so I do think like right when I would get my groove and be like, this is the balance it would, they would shift. So they always keep you kind of rethinking what balance is. Um, I also feel like, you know, as I'm looking back on what parenting young kids looked like and recognizing that that was such a specific moment in time that was so painful and does pass that I think there is an aspect about being patient with yourself about not being in balance um, and just sort of accepting that for what it is. I was a suboptimal parent, suboptimal um, at my job. I was mostly tired, um, but I just trudged through it for those first handful of years. And then there is another side. And I would say what I'm looking at now, and I mentioned this earlier, but we just, you know, we've had a nanny who like enabled my career, who I'm so grateful with, helped me raise these kids along with my husband. And, um, and we were, you know, able to, when she, she wanted to go off and have another child and, and it kind of worked and we're like, you know what? I don't think we need a nanny anymore. Like that was a huge moment. And it wasn't just like, oh, I started to get a ton of free time. It was, you know what? I am working from home, but my kids are able to be more independent. They don't need me to watch them every second. They can go play in the backyard and that works. So um, I think there's just this sort of aspect of understanding what the different phases look like and then giving yourself forgiveness in certain ones. There was no balance for me when my kids were like two years old um, and then evolving with it and, and, you know, figuring out what it looks like and as, as things change. You know, and for me, I'm definitely optimizing towards it from a career standpoint also. I definitely am thinking about over time, how do I build a career um, and and a team that I, I can focus my time on doing the highest value things for the company, uh, but not spending a lot of my time doing the other things so that I can kind of reclaim my time without, um, you know, in any way diminishing what the company gets from me. I love that. And I think that that's, that's such a smart way of running any, any aspect of life. You know, it's like, how do I prioritize my time? Because time is everything, you know, it's that finite resource that we all have, you know, we all have those 24 hours in the day. And then it's like, okay, how do I spend this? This is really like my life energy. And where am I putting that? And where am I putting my focus? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that really sticks out, I mean, I've done countless interviews over the years and, you know, talked to experts and, and, you know, moms and authors and all of that. One thing that keeps coming up again and again and again is how difficult it is for mothers in particular to take time for downtime and to rest and to not just, you know, have a glass of wine and, and kind of leave their bodies, but to really nourish themselves and to really connect with themselves why do you think that is, and how is Lunia, your company, addressing that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I think there's, like, no message that I'm more excited about than, you know, the importance of taking that time to rest. Um, and I, I would say, you know, there's something really – it's interesting, and I don't know if it's cultural or, or what it is, but we certainly have – some incredibly high expectations of ourselves as parents. And I would even go so far as to say these days, I think parenting has always been hard, but I even say we, we continually raise the stakes on ourselves. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, when I was younger, uh, a lot of my after school looked like going around with my mom to do the errands she needed to do. I didn't like the world wasn't catered to all of my interests. Now I definitely, she, I, I had a lovely childhood and I got to do things I was passionate about, but, you know, I, I also, uh, you know, I just, if I had to go to the grocery store with her and, and do, you know, do whatever the laundry mat and whatever the things were that she needed. And I just look at us now and we're just so, you know, optimized. We're, we're doing a lot of that digitally and like our after schools, a lot of us are like building these, you know, incredible list of activities and trying to make everything sort of perfect and enriching and, you know, really holding high standards for ourselves. Um, and so I do think forgiving ourselves, we don't want to feel like we're failing. You know, we don't want to take that time and be like, Oh, I just, I got too tired. It feels, it feels like somehow, you know, you're, um, like, like a waving the flag, you know, almost, but 
in my opinion, and it's so funny because we see it so clearly with kids. So I'm going to use my daughter as an example. I've gotten, I've started to have to train her when she's really tired because she just melts down all the time. And she's seven. So at a certain point, I'm looking at her being like, hey, I get it when you were three, but now you're seven. So you have to recognize that emotion, take a deep breath and go take a nap if you need it. And I've, I've started to train her to do that, which is insane. But I can, we all sort of joke uh, within the family about how she comes down a different person. And I think we all accept that, of course, that's the norm with kids, but that's the norm with parents too, you know? And I think um, building in, you know, I think maybe reframing it from it's like this idea of um, uh, I need a break to, you know, I need to like be my best self. It's like, I need to recharge so I can show up and be even better. It's how I look at it with my kids. And so for my husband and I, we both have nap time on Saturday and Sunday, actually, um, where we, um, yeah, from one to three. And you know what happened is our kids were late nappers. Um, and I, totally attribute this to the amazing nanny that I had who I mentioned earlier, but she, you know, when our kids wanted to give up nap, she's kind of like, no, nap's still happening. And it was amazing because they went through that phase where we thought they were done. And then because they sort of perceived that stopping napping wasn't on the table, they just kept napping. And so they napped in the days until they went to kindergarten. And then when they stopped, um, my husband and I said, Hey, it is still nap time in this house. And we will let you guys leave your rooms and you can go play somewhere else as long as you don't, you know, for non-emergencies, you don't wake us up, you don't, whatever. And, um, and if you do wake us up a bunch because you're fighting or whatever, then you'll have to go back to nap time in in your rooms. And so, um, it's been amazing. So now, like I said, I've got a nine-year-old son, I was just about nine. And then I have a seven-year-old daughter and like, we still can get our nap time. They, they've, come to accept that that is what it is. So I would say that's one trick I would say also for getting that, that rest. I love that. I love that. I'm, I have two boys, the exact same age, seven and nine. And, uh, the fighting I think would be the, the clincher <laughs> in my household. Cause they're so rough, but no, I love that idea. Yeah. It, it's been, it's been a godsend. I'll tell you what, I, I'm so much happier on the weekend. And it's like, then that weekend really becomes a recharge for the week in like a whole new way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then even just like connecting with your husband, you know, even though you're just sleeping, like you're there together. I mean, how often do we get that time, you know, when we're not, it's not the regular, you know, night sleep. Exactly. So, I mean, Lunia is, is a luxury sleepwear brand. Why do you think, again, it's like, it's so hard for us as mothers to, to buy the things that are, you know, considered nice, you know, you get everything for the kids, you, you know, you take care of the house, this, this, and that, you've got your work attire, but then it's like, it's like those, those nice, luxurious items where like, oh, you know, I'll just push it off or, oh, you know, I don't want to get that for myself. I don't deserve that. Like, what is that? What is that block that exists? And I'm not talking about it in like a capitalistic way, but it's like those little things that we can do for ourselves that just, it just nourish us just for us. Like, what do you think is blocking a lot of women? And, and for the women that, that pass that, what do you think they have that we're, we're missing? It's funny. I was just having a conversation with a girlfriend of mine and she is pretty strung out. And I was like, you just need to go away. You need to take a couple of days. Your family would be happy to be okay for a couple of days. Just do it. And she really had trouble um, doing that for herself you know, and, and actually still hasn't done it. I'm constantly pressuring her about it. But it is really interesting because I think that (laughs) that ties into this kind of like willingness to treat ourselves to to um, to feel worthy in some ways. And I think that I, I don't know, I have and I might be off here. I sometimes think it's that we diminish the task of motherhood. You know, we we use words like, oh, you know, and and I think this, you know, oh, the you know, when you leave the house or like this person's working and she's staying home with the kids. And so I think that sometimes even in the way we're positioning that as almost not qualifying as a job, um, that we kind of are positioning it where, oh, it's not that hard. Like you, you shouldn't need a break. Like it's okay. You don't, you know, you're not in some cases when, you know, I have, I do have a number of friends that are stay at home moms 
and um, and they feel like, oh, you know, I'm not contributing to like bringing in a lot of income, and so I don't want to spend on myself. And so there's a lot of really interesting things that I think come together to kind of create that sense of like I don't like a sort of unworthiness or like not deserving. Uh, and I think some of that is the way we talk about motherhood. And, and even like when we use expressions like doing it all in a weird way, it diminishes sometimes what motherhood is, because I think it makes it sound like something that you could be a full-time mom and have a full-time job and like be happy and not strung out and that all those things are, are coexisting naturally. And I have yet to find that woman. So I, I think that we're sort of setting up this, this, uh, example to be true and to be possible. And then when someone feels like, you know, that, that they're struggling with it, it, it's, they sort of feel, um, oh gosh, what's wrong with me that I'm, it's so hard for me, you know? And so I I think there's like a really interesting, um, coupling of that feeling and some of the standards that, that we've put on, on sort of that role and associated with it. Um, but I will say with, you know, with Looney, I think one of the things I, also think is interesting is what we do prioritize or value or allow ourselves to buy. You know, we will buy a dress for a cocktail, you know, event that we're going to wear a couple of times. And I think it's interesting that we feel like that's worthwhile. You know, if you think about that in terms of like how much you're going to wear it or, you know, how much value it really brings in your life, it's actually kind of hard to justify. And yet sometimes we feel, oh, of course we need to do that. And, um, and I think about it from the stance, I used to think, oh, when I would buy expensive jeans, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. But then I look at those jeans and they're in my closet the longest and they have the, probably the highest value per wear. And so I think some of it is also reframing, you know, to me that the everyday luxury of being able to put something on that sets you up for a good night of rest, that makes you feel your best, that makes you feel relaxed and put together, even while being very comfortable, to me the value of that on an everyday standpoint is incredibly high. And then, you know, when I think about Lunia specifically, there's, there's sort of the, um, the value of feeling put together, which is a little bit more of like an optical kind of like, you know, you feel good when you feel like you're wearing something that's flattering you. But I think there's also just a whole really important functional component that we've become accustomed to when we would say, work out, you know, we're accustomed to this idea that we would want to wear clothes that are going to, make sure we don't bounce when we're running and, you know, be not have painful seams and uncomfortable spots. And, but I think there's an opportunity to really look at sleep in this way. And actually I wear an aura ring and I've really liked that it's shifting people's perspectives and we're all kind of part of the same conversation around actually let's look at sleep as a thing to be optimized and to be elevated in importance in our life to be the kind of thing that we count, just like we might count minutes on a treadmill. And I think once you start looking at it that way um, and really valuing it, and that, then I think you're completely, uh, you're shifting its importance in your, in your life. And then I think you want to think about, okay, well, how do I sleep well? You know, how am I resting well? And for us, a lot of our clothes are really designed from a functional standpoint to think about temperature. You know, we have We have products that help cool your body down. Temperature is one of the biggest things that wakes people up or flat seams, um, coverage in places that, you know, you, you want coverage, especially if you're going to maybe like be taking off your under layer when you're going to sleep, you know, just really thinking about things that don't ride up, things that don't bunch, don't twist, really having a very smartly designed product so that you're not just resting, but you are resting well. Yeah. I think it's so brilliant what you're doing because this is such an untapped market, you know, sleepwear, because, you know, I had Dave Asprey on the show back in September and, you know, his whole thing is sleep and how much that affects every single other thing in your life, you know, from stress to, to healing to how often you get sick even. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling. And I feel like we know this in the back of our minds, we've heard the reports and the studies, but until you actually start looking at yourself and your, your own practices and what you're doing on a day-to-day basis, it's like you don't really address it. And then when you do start addressing it, you're like, whoa, you know, your life does change so drastically. I mean, just look at your weekend naps. I mean, that alone. <laughs> oh, it's, it's amazing. I'll go, you know, go upstairs and feel kind of irritated at people and I'll wake up and it's like I got a different brain. Like it's so um, yeah. transformational, you know, and I think that we don't, 
think about it enough. I mean, one of the things that I'm excited about, about all this digitizing of our health, where we're like storing all this information about our workouts and our heart rates and our, and our sleep is I think it will start being regarded as actually truly one of those, um, like a, a valid health, you know, consideration. Oh, how much are you sleeping yeah. at night? Like to me, that feels like that should be a question whenever you go in about an ailment, because that is when your body, I mean, you know, scientifically like recovers itself, like where your brain stores long-term yes. memories, you know, where a lot of this important, uh, body and brain function happens. So it feels like something, um, that instead of prioritizing a society, and we talked kind of, this brings it back full circle, what we were talking about earlier, but this like hamster on a wheel, never off kind of mentality. We're not even, we don't have the hardware for it. We're not designed physically to be able to be always on. So then we're suboptimal when we are, if we are trying to live in that way. Yeah. So for any woman listening to this, I just want to reiterate like how beautiful, you know, getting sleep is not just, you know, it, it, consider it as part of like your meditation practice or your workout routine or your nutrition. I mean, it's, it's such a strong component in an overall health and wellness routine. I think we can't, we can't minimize that. I think it's so important. And I think women know it. I think it's the challenge of going, well, how do you get it? Like, they'll be like, well, how do you get it? And it does connect back to what we said is like, at a certain point, you need to think it's important. And then when you're, when it's important to you, yeah. your, you know, your family, it's also good. You know, it's, there's an element of sometimes when you tell people what you need, that's, they know how to give you what you need and they feel good about that too. And, and through that weird things have yeah. come, you know, my kids, because I say from one to three and I've been doing that for so long that they're on their own, they've learned how they go through, they sort of solve problems together because they have to, neither of them wants to lose their freedom during that time. You know, it's amazing yeah. the creative play I'll walk in on, you know, just them doing like weird things on the grass, like rolling around and inventing games. You know, so it's one of those things that when you say, hey, this yeah. is going to happen in this household um, and they believe you and you stick to it, they, um, you know, it, it's sometimes an interesting opportunity. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. I mean, that's such an important thing for me, too, is like having the boys be able to get outside because we live on a creek and like just play and figure things out. And even if they're by themselves, like having their own internal world you know, where I'm not like, Hey, what are you doing? Da, 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 da. Or yes. even just like screens of any kind, like it changes their brain. Like it makes them yes. their own person, you know, like as much as we are parents of them, like they are going to be their own people in life. You know, they're on their own trajectory. Ooh, scary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> if, if you could describe, I mean, if Lunia had a soul, how would you describe the soul of the company, its mission, its purpose in the world? So, what I say about Lunia is that it's on a mission to elevate rest, which obviously ties into this whole conversation we're having. And I think about elevate um, in a lot of ways. I mean, honestly, we, we agonized over that mission and, and really tightening up what that meant. Um, and the reason we did is because, you know, I think every word really matters. And I think we have a unique approach to it. I think there's Brands like let's use a Casper who might be more about going, you need to sleep eight hours a day. And, you know, they're sort of like informational. And I don't think that our problem is informational. You know, I think our problem is uh, more around uh, priority, value, and, you know, sort of back to the permission thing. You know, like I think if you think it's important, I think we've been convinced over many years that, for example, getting physical exercise is important. We've all come to accept that that might be a, a valid thing to take time for in the day. And I think there's an aspect of that's what sleep needs. It needs a rebrand. It needs to be um, elevated in the importance in people's lives. It needs to be feel like instead of when I take that nap that I'm, that I'm lazy or that I'm um, avoidant, that it's actually like, oh, I'm like giving my body um, sustenance. It's like eating a healthy meal. I'm filling myself up so I can be my best self. And, um, I think somewhere in there, that's really what we seek to do is to kind of celebrate that time to make that feel worthy and to luxuriate a little bit, you know, to go, Hey, it's, you can have 
you can rest and then you can rest really well. And what does that mean? And from my standpoint, that's, you know, setting up an environment where you can fall asleep, whether that's, I need four pillows. So I realize that makes me like the princess, <laughs> but that's like, I, I build this like cocoon for myself. I've got a like pillow between my knee. And it's so funny. One of my friends just told me yesterday, she sleeps the same way. So I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not the only freak with the pillows. So, you know, like this is, this is how I set myself up. And the fabric of my clothes really matters for me because I'm like, I hate when I get twisted. It literally is so irritating to me. It's hard enough for me to get sleep and then to be woken up by my clothes feels just like, oh, it's irritating. Um, and so just really like, how are we create? How are you creating an environment that nurtures that resting? Um, and that can be some people, you know, really being strict about not having their phones near their bed. Or I also like to fall asleep to moving pictures on on Netflix. So oh. I highly recommend that to people when you need to calm your brain at night. So all these little rituals that we do to create um, one of the or the most important rest restorative experiences that that we get, and we do it on a daily basis. So I think. Elevating rest feels very important, particularly in a society where I think we're seeing a lot of the results of the burnout um, of the always on kind of nature of it. And I think figuring out how to make people feel justified and okay and taking the break and turning things off. That's, that's really, um, I think that's an important thing to, to make sure society values and people take time for if they're trying to be healthy and their best selves. And, and so we're hopefully a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, just going back to that self-worth, you know, valuing ourselves and, and elevating ourselves, you know, and knowing that this is something that we're going to be wearing almost every single night, like it's worth it. Um, and this episode is yeah. coming out the week of Mother's yeah. Day. So for all of you mothers listening, do you have any final message that you would like to leave with them? You know, when I think about what motherhood is, a lot of it is the days are long and the years are short. Um, you know, depending on what day, what stage you're at, but I would say um, to be patient with yourself, understand that you're in a phase no matter what phase you're in and you'll get through it um, and, um, and take the time you need to, um, to, be, you know, to be rested, comfortable, so you can feel sane through all of the crazy chaos that motherhood throws at you. Um, so again, for everyone listening, where can they find out more about you and Lumia? Sure. Um, you can follow me if you're interested in this whole entrepreneurial journey. Um, Ashley double underscore Merrill um, at, on Instagram. And then Lunia is um, at Lunia um, and then Lunia.co. And then we actually also have a men's brand, um, bringing rest to men too. So Lago, L-A-H-G-O. Oh. Um, I know Father's Day will be right around the corner here, so you can just kind of get in front of that one. Um, and so those are the best ways to stay in touch, Lago, Lunia, or, or follow me on Instagram. Oh, done, done. I already have so much Lunia in my closet. I can't wait to get some for my husband, honestly, because uh, it's gross what he wears to bed. I mean, I was trying <laughs> to throw out his old stuff actually. Was, so this is perfect. It was funny how we ended up in men's because so many men would walk into our store and be like, what about us? And I'd be like, oh yeah, I need to really think about something for the guys so they can be comfortable too. Yeah. We had a lot, of, a lot of very soft for men. It seemed like softness was like a big. No, seriously. Now that like men have their own line, like I feel like the whole sleep and branding sleep will skyrocket because they are enjoying it too and getting the benefits too. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, Ashley, thank you so much. This is so much fun catching back up with you. It's, you are truly an inspiration to all of us working moms out there and stay at home moms as well. Cause we're all in this together. We're all doing this. So, so thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed podcast. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast.